And even though people joke about Canadians living in igloos and igloos and all this stuff, rumor has it, you actually just built an igloo for your kids. You talk <laughs> to me about this. <laughs> hey, Joel. Um, thanks so much for having me on the show, man. I appreciate the invite and um, the igloo. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, it's a, a, just a new endeavor as, as everybody is, seems to be diving into new things during this pandemic and it's extra cold now. And I happened to see a, a video of some other local folks building an ice igloo and had me scratching my head and watching a couple of YouTube videos. I'm like, that's pretty easy. Something to do in the spare time. My daughter would lose her marbles over it and have a lot of fun and kids in the neighborhood to come and play and whatever. And that's, that's what I did. I built an ice igloo. They're not hard to do. <laughs> and in our temperatures, it really only took, and in the time I had really only took me about a week and a half. Um, I only had so many containers to make ice blocks out of, and you got to wait a couple of days for them all to freeze. And then time and sunlight after work was slim, <laughs> but uh, we made it happen. And now it's starting to melt and, and it's looking pretty skeletal and, and uh, we're just, you know, still having fun with it and, and it's something to do. I hate the winter and I was born in Canada, born and raised. I feel like as I get older, every year is more and more painful, but I'm trying to flip the script and find some, find some light in there and find some love for the, for the snow. And, and uh, this was a really fun project. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to be one of those, like, you know, snowbirds that go to Florida every winter as they get older. Normally I'm in Mexico, but the pandemic uh, has kept me here. I'm the same. I, I like snowboarding and I like hockey and that's about it in the winters. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of how it goes for a lot of Canadians. And, and, uh, and as you get older, you know, the body feels it a little bit more, but, uh, but if you can find some, some good things in it, uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Igloos are kind of, they're war they're, they can get warm. Uh, and at nighttime, what I did, I put some thinner pieces of ice in the, in the top. You can still see the glow of the moon and, and just sitting inside of it, even though I, I live in a suburb and there's a lot of other houses around us and a lot of kids uh, by nighttime, most of them are asleep and, and, uh, it, it, the, the silence is in the silence inside the igloo is really awesome. It's a, it's a good meditation spot. If you're yeah. into that, if you can, yeah, handle, yeah, yeah. if you can handle the cold, see, you thought of, you saw people making igloos and you thought, Oh, that's easy. I can do that. I'm thinking, man, that looks tough. How do you keep the top on? How does that work? Hmm. I wondered the same thing. And I was worried about that a little bit. So I did do the top pieces a little bit thinner than the sides. Um, but yeah, just going to the dollar store and getting some, you know, 10 inch by 13 inch tin baking trays for a buck a piece. I got a dozen of them, uh, fill them up as much as you can there, you know, at, at an inch and a half thick or so, if you fill them a little thinner, the, the, the tins themselves have a bit of an angle on them. So if you just keep putting them together like that, it starts to curve inside mm. for the roof. Uh, otherwise, you know, you do them the other way. So they keep going straight up for the walls and that slush working the slush together as mortar is, is, um, um, it's, it's amazing at the right temperature. It just freezes immediately and the whole thing's ice and you're just, you're happening. <laughs> it's easy, easier than you think really. It's crazy. So <laughs> if, if, if all else fails, if this, if this interview, this conversation crash and burns, at least everyone in Canada now knows how to make an igloo. So there's a, a to-do <laughs> there that we started off. Yeah, they're like, here. great. He taught us how to make an igloo and we can tune out now. That's awesome. <laughs> give, give the people what they want right off the top. What, uh, <laughs> what, what was your, your kid's response to this igloo? I mean, they were, they were helping you, right? It wasn't like they showed up and it was done. Yeah. Well, so I have a five-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son, a good gap between them. A teenager in the house and a very influential uh, kindergartner, and um, she <laughs> I shouldn't say very influential, very easily influenced uh, by her teenage brother, and and but the but 
the but she was still more she's also my more creative of the two and she's she was more hands-on than he was he's kind of like uh do i have to come out i made him come out a few times to help me with some of the ones i needed someone to hold on to for a minute uh to get all all fixed on but uh nah and it was it's more for her physical height the thing was like a grand castle it's like this it's elsa's castle right <laughs> and she's yeah right into that so it's just uh, the smaller we are the the more larger than life things are so for her it was a bit more epic than it was for him although when when i when he helped me finish it he was pushing through and 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 i'm like okay i'm done i can finish the rest by myself he's like no no, no i want to i want to help you finish the last bunch of pieces so i can see it finished so then he got stoked about it and everybody was right into it even my mom and other neighbors like i said were coming over to check it out and taking pictures and <laughs> that's fun it's a fun project something to do your your son sounds like me at 14 not wanting to (laughs) to be a part of anything and uh when when you said you know your daughter with her size when she looks up it looks massive like a real castle like every size is relative right and it reminded me uh, they just released the first of three parts of a new kanye west documentary so it's called uh genius but like spelled more like you know, I watched it. I watched it the other day. OK, so yeah. um, it reminded me of a scene where he's with his mom, Donda, and and he's starting to have success. And she basically in a way of telling him to stay humble, like be confident, but stay humble. She says when a giant looks in a mirror, he doesn't see a giant like a giant just sees. To a giant, a giant is normal. And that's what she's saying, like you can be a giant, but when you look in the mirror, just see yourself don't see that giant so that's what your your comment about your daughter and the size just clicked for me yeah man and and and, um i thought that one struck a chord with me too watching that same episode um i've always really took that to heart because i've always been a huge fan of music such as yourself and and i admired that in other musicians i really admire the people that i looked up to that the few that i did get to meet that were as humble as could be are still to this day, some of my biggest influences and probably that, that had a huge part to do with it. Um, and I always found, I loved it just as much as fans loved it, that I would get off the stage most of the time with as far as salad stuff would go in our, at some of our bigger events and bigger concerts and get right into the crowd and wander crowds. And I would hear people at certain points of the, the peak of our career, you know, oh, that's, what's that guy doing? What's he wandering around? Oh, it's the sad guy in the salads. And you're just a normal, I, I just feel like a, just a, a person. I want to be part of that crowd just the same. Um, and uh, I'm getting a, a edit up update here. Some weird thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, I relate to that. And the band has always said, and, and even if you've, if you've seen our, uh, our, our DVD that we put out, the uh, band gone wild around 2004, uh, around there. Um, the guys all mentioned how there's a lot of part, a lot of parts of our history where they felt like I was more of a part of the audience than I was in the band when performing on stage. Cause I want to share that experience and I want the audience to feel as much as of what we're feeling because I'm doing what I'm doing and feeling the way I'm feeling a large part due to them being there Uh, and the music and camaraderie and all that together just creates this tornado of what you've seen and what people have seen on stage by the salads. Um, so that's important. That's an important thing. It, staying grounded and and we're all human, no matter what TV channel you're on, what book page you've been in, or what whatever. People, I, I think that's especially these days is quickly forgotten. We all jump to what kind of people we are, what what religion we are, what what political party we support what color our skin is all that stuff and we forget that we have all got blood running through our veins and we're people um that's important man that's one of the most important things in life i think humble being humble yeah yeah don't don't see the giant in the mirror 
Absolutely. One of, one of the biggest bands I worked with that if anyone had a right to have an ego was this band. So this was Rush. I was able to work mm. with Rush back in the day uh, on a charity event. So we raised about $140,000 in one day for charity with Rush. And what's crazy is, you know, outside of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, there's no band on the planet that has more um, gold, platinum, and multi-platinum albums in Rush. Like they just, you know, they're not selling 10 million copies of an album like some bands, but across their entire discography, it's like every album basically has gone gold or platinum or multi-platinum. So this, you know, I don't know if it's because they're Canadian is why they're they're so nice despite all that success. But when I when I worked with them, they show they showed up at this event they walked right by all the people that they knew. It's like they knew those guys were already good. And they walked right up to the people that were helping the event. And, you know, hey, thank you so much for helping. We couldn't have done this without you. You know, uh, food is over there if you need anything. And when they knew that everyone that was helping them was good, they went and hung out with with their their friends afterwards. And I have a letter, a handwritten custom rush letter uh, on my fridge after them just doing that, thanking me was enough. They sent me a handwritten letter again saying, this is all the good that we did. We couldn't have done it without you signed by the band. And to this day, like that, that's made a huge impression on me. And you would think someone like Rush, you'd be like, oh yeah, I mean, it's okay. Rush didn't talk to me. You know, it's, it's Rush. But so that's my biggest example of a, a massive band that still, still gives it, gives the fans what they want, you know? That's solid, man. Right. And see, and that, and that struck a chord with you and still to this day, and you'll still be telling that story till the day you die. Probably that's huge to me. That that's the kind of stuff that is life-changing and so heavily influential to people that we need more of that. Um, yeah. It's beautiful. I love that. My funny, my, I'm not a huge rush fan, but I, uh, as far as their music goes, but fully respect their position in, in music and history and Canadian history at that. Um, but my closer connection is um, my, my mom went to high school with Neil Peart. No and way. Actually, just on the other side of this wall, I've got a stack of her yearbooks with photos of him as a kid in them. Um, and I remember finding that out and realizing that in high school and making a little collage on the photocopier to bring in. Did she Fred. know? Did she know? Or you just happened to. Oh, yeah, she knew. She knew. She okay. told me about it. She was like, th they didn't hang out or anything. She was, she remembered, she was. A cheerleader he was you know the pot smoking hippie at the back of her math class with his pencils on the desk um that was the relationship you know she she <laughs> looking back she's like i you know wish i had you know chatted with him more hung out would pick his brain or whatever but they just did they weren't part of the same world just the same math class at the same yeah. high school I, i'd up assume in, in i'd assume as a cheerleader she's more you know with the the jocks and and you know yeah the, yeah the sports people and he's more with the 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 nerds and the the hippies and the musicians that's what it was man yeah my my, my birth father eventually was a, a, a football guy so that, that's how my mom and, and him connected and but uh but just yeah growing up in saint Catharines and going to that high school neil period happened to be in the math class and and uh uh, and others and whatever but yeah, it's funny seeing these high school yearbook pictures <laughs> one, one of the greatest drummers of all time you know every few oh. months there's a new list from drummer magazine from rolling stone greatest drummers of all time and neil pert's always top three. always always, always yeah. in there yeah. yeah yeah i i i finally saw rush live um it was on their tour they had a new album something about clocks clockwork something um right right and man, the noise that just three people can make, it sounds like they're a 12 piece band. And it, I, I mean, it helps that each member is playing like three instruments, you know, but yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. Actually, there was another time that where the salads were doing an, uh, an interview in Toronto at Cherry Beach Sound Studios. We rehearsed in the same space, but did an interview in their studio at one point in time. And Rush was rehearsing in there for some shows or something coming up. They happened to be out on a lunch break while we were doing the interview in the studio, but Neil Peart's drum set was all set up in the studio and looked like so a we were, spaceship. Yeah. We were admiring it and, and just checking everything out, especially our drummer, of course. Um, but what I thought was really cool and what still sticks in my head was just the, that it was all 
set up and packed in this like wooden box with proper holes and hinges on it so that the box could just be unhinged and all the walls drop and it's still set up exactly as it is in the studio. And then they just put the walls back up, leave it set up and rehinge it. And everything was all set in place so that this whole box could just be moved the full kit set up because it was so intricate. Um, that was a trip to see too. <laughs> so I remember that. Someone should give that drum tech a raise or at least the assistant mm. engineer, whoever is working that kit. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. 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 I can't imagine how many techs he would have had with him touring and whatnot, but I yeah. bet, I bet his drum tech is probably like an incredible drummer. Like you'd have to be to understand what's going on, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I would imagine so too. I, I guess that's like a lot of bands when their guitarist leaves the band or quits a lot of times it's the guitar tech that that replaces them because they know the equipment yeah, inside out they know the songs inside out and they're usually insanely talented guitarists or musicians whatever the instrument is yeah exactly so long as some other uh more familiar face doesn't come along and <laughs> yeah and if, they, if that Dave spot. Navarro shows up then he's probably got it right there you go exactly exactly the, the chili peppers tech didn't uh get that gig <laughs> but actually the redemption of this story is um so they're about to release a new album and they have john frusciante back which is awesome right, right. but yeah, the yeah. album before that was their guitar tech was the the guitarist so oh yeah yeah oh there you go i i, I you know what to be honest one of my favorite bands growing up um hugely influential but after californication yeah they lost they lost me <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, what about uh, stadium arcadium that was a solid one then there was a few uh, after that too there might have been or? there might have been some jams in it but i think it was too poppy for me mm. yeah i've always i've always said i'd love to see them go back to george clinton and do a record with him again and 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 see some freaky styly what album was that era like mother's milk so, or earlier no than but that? early earlier than that yeah yeah george clinton produced one if not two records for them uh, freaky styly i think um the the real colorful wild crazy ones but he i just listened to an interview that um he did recently with um uh, quest love of the roots who's got a, a great podcast called quest love supreme too and um did a long interview with george clinton and ended up talking a little bit about chili peppers which you don't hear him talk about much these days um and he but he was just like yeah it's, i mean the, the record i think it's freaky style yeah is predominantly george clinton and p funk riffs but done in a punk kind of style um, where he was there to bring the funk for them. They were taking that influence, but making it sound dirty and punk, which he didn't understand. So, and that just created that punk funk thing that the chili peppers were doing that they eventually cleaned up during blood sugar, sex magic and so on. And then really mellowed out and popped out in, in like a, almost a new age style is the way I see it up until now, uh, you know, more modern like that. Uh, but yeah, it was dirty punk funk stuff. And that was, he was very um, uh, involved in their early, early inception, first few records kind of st kind of stuff. 